We're going to be in Matthew 24 and 25. Um, before we actually read the public reading, I actually want to set the tone with something uh, from 2 Timothy. Uh, if you want to turn there, you can uh, just put your finger here in Matthew 24. We're going to come right back to that. But in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul says something as almost a passing moment that I want us to, to draw on this morning as we begin. He says this, chapter 4, starting in verse 6. Paul, so what, what is 2 Timothy? 2 Timothy is the last letter that we have from Paul. These are some of the last words that the Apostle Paul wrote to, for, for, for the church. Verse 6 says, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. It's at the end of his life. He knows it. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And this is where I want to zero in. Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. This is our hope. As people who have been bought by Jesus, we get to look ahead to a day when we will receive a crown. An inheritance is laid up for us in heaven. And there's this phrase here that I want to ring in your mind. He says, not only to me, but also to all who have loved His appearing. This is why we wanted to turn here. Before we we read Matthew 24 and 25, this is my desire for all of us. That we would be a people who love the appearing of Jesus Christ and who long for it with a deep longing. And that anybody who's not in Christ, that that they would not look to that day with dread, but with hope. That's that's what I want to happen in us today. So turn back to Matthew 24. And if you're able to now, would you stand in honor of the reading of God's Word? We're going to read chapter 24, starting in verse 1. We're going to read to verse 35. So we're going to read a pretty big section here. Um, So don't lock your knees. Chapter 24, verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was going away when His disciples came to point out to Him the buildings of the temple. But He answered them, You see all these, do you not? Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. As He sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to Him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ. And they will lead many astray. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not alarmed. For this must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what is in his house. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on Sabbath, for then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. No, it never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. 
Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. So if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, and do not, if they say to you, look, he's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever the corpse is there, the vultures will gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see all these things, you know that He is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Let's pray. Our God, as we consider the words of Matthew 24 that we've just read and then as we move into the end of Matthew 24 and, and chapter 25, uh, we ask that you would shape our hearts by these words. Help us to think rightly, to be sober-minded as we consider these words, and to respond appropriately. We pray this in your name. Amen. You can be seated. In 1776, George Washington, maybe you've heard of him before, led the first battles of the American Revolution. 1776. By 1777, it was clear that they were facing a foe that was beyond them. And that foe was not the British Army. It was smallpox. They were losing more men to disease than they were to battle. And Washington had a controversial decision to make. He decided to inoculate his entire army against smallpox. Vaccines were not as safe in those days, so there was a high likelihood that men would die because a vaccine would go wrong at some point. But if they didn't deal with it, then smallpox would slowly destroy the army. In war, pestilence and disease are common. You often hear those things related, right? It was only a matter of time before everyone in the army was exposed and probably affected by smallpox. It could devastate the army at a time when strategically they needed to know how many men they had. So, Washington took the gamble. He inoculated the entire army, and not a single unit was incapacitated because of the inoculation. And as a result, the army was able to operate without fear of smallpox in the ranks. In our text today, Jesus is inoculating his troops against a particular type of infection. He inoculates them by telling them what's going to happen so that when it happens, they will be prepared for it. He wanted them to be prepared for the day when false prophets would come. He wanted them to be prepared for the day when they would be tempted to be complacent. He wanted them to be prepared for the day when they would doubt whether Jesus would really return. He wanted to shape vigilance and diligence in them so that in the day of trial they would continue on, knowing that in the final day they would hear from the Lord, You are mine, enter into my rest. He wanted them to be prepared for the day that He would return to take His own to Himself. So I was preparing for this sermon. I kept having lyrics pop into my head from this 90s Christian song called People Get Ready, 
Jesus is coming. You know that song? People get ready. Jesus is coming. Soon we'll be going home. I went back and listened to it in all of its 90s contemporary Christian glory, and it was painful to listen to. <laughs> so I turned it off, and then I went and I read the lyrics. And the words are actually really great. You should go read the lyrics. You don't have to listen to it. That's okay. Uh, I think I've only ever heard the chorus of that song before that. Interesting. Just a tidbit. I think, though, that this is what God wants for us today. He wants us to be reminded of this reality that Jesus is coming back. So get ready. Be prepared for that day. Get inoculated against the lies of the enemy and get ready for the return of Jesus. In our text, Jesus begins this inoculation by telling the disciples that Jerusalem would fall, that the temple would be destroyed. Now, you remember last time in chapter 23, he pronounces woes to the scribes and the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. And then at the end of chapter 23, if you have your Bible open, you look right up there, he has a lament at the end. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets, those who are sent to them. How many times it would have gathered you up as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. And then he left. And what I think is a symbolic and real act, Jesus, the God-man, left the temple. And then, and at the beginning of our text, he says, after the disciples point to the temple, he says, You see all these, do you not? This is verse 1, you can see that. Truly I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And the disciples ask two very natural questions at this. The temple was central to Jewish life. Central, absolutely essential for the Jewish society to continue. So when they hear that, when they hear that not one stone will be left on another, what they hear is the end of Jewish society as it is. And so they asked some natural questions. Verse 3, look down there. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so begins what's called the Olivet Discourse. It's called this because it happened while Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. That's it. Nothing else special there. The disciples ask two questions here. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming of the end of the age? Those are the two questions they ask. Most people agree that when the disciples ask this, they probably think that they're asking about a single reality because they're tying the existence of the temple and of Jerusalem with the coming of the Messiah. They're tying those things together. But they do ask two separate questions, and Jesus answers it as if it is two entirely separate questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? He does answer their question about the temple. But he takes the opportunity to address much more. And he does this because he wants to prepare them. Right? We've already said this. We need, you and I, here, right now, we need the same inoculation. We need the same warnings, the same preparation for days and times that are yet ahead of us so that we would walk in them faithfully. So before we start working through our text, I just want to point out the flow of our text, because I'm just going to assume it for the rest of our time. So if you look down at, at the text, I'm just going to describe some things that are happening. First, the disciples ask this question up at 24, 1 and 2. Then in chapter 24, verses 3 to 14, Jesus answers them with general truths that largely summarize the rest of our text today. But then in verses, in verses 15 to 21 of chapter 24, Jesus foretells, this is verses 15 to 21, Jesus foretells the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70 is when that happened. Then after that, starting in chapter 24, verse 29, and, and all the way to the end of our passage today, Jesus tell them, tells them that when He comes, it will be the end of tribulation. There will be a final judgment. And He spends the last part of chapter 24 and then all of chapter 25 telling parables, teaching about how we can be ready for that day, whenever that day may come. So let's look to the text. I've got three points. Uh, sorry, I, I wrote three here in my manuscript. 
but there's actually four because I added another one after I wrote that down. So there's four points, and then there's quite a few bonus points. So there we go. Uh, it's one of the longest outlines I think I've ever done. So have fun, you guys who, who write really long form notes. Chapter, uh, sorry, chapter 24, verses 1 to 28, we see this reality, that this age will be filled with distress, lawlessness, and false Christs. This age will be filled with distress, lawlessness, and false Christs. After the disciples ask these questions that we just talked about a moment ago, the first thing that Jesus says is in verse 4. What's his response? He says, see that no one leads you astray. He doesn't jump straight to an answer to their question. He gives them a warning. See that no one leads you astray. And this is instructive for us. Around this topic of the end times, we need to be careful. People will, need, will make claims. We need to be ready to approach them with discretion. But Jesus doesn't just leave it with this warning of false Christs, false prophets. Look in verse 6, chapter 24, verse 6. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Then look in verse 7. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of the birth pains. Wars and earthquakes and false teachers, these things are already terrifying. But he doesn't stop there. Look in verse 9. He keeps going. They will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another, and many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Jesus is outlining a really grim picture here, isn't he? It's grim, but if we read it and we consider for a moment, we can recognize that it's also very normal. These things happen every day. If you glance over church history, you'll see all of these things happening constantly. From the time Jesus said it up till now, these things are descriptive of the entire age in which we live. But why? Why is Jesus telling us this? Why is He telling us how bad it's going to be? I see three reasons that are right here in the text, and we're just going to run through those, comment on them really quickly. These are some of those bonus points, so get ready. Uh, these are not main points, but we're going to say first, second, third. Ready? Uh, I see three reasons. So that, one, we wouldn't be alarmed when it happens. So that we wouldn't follow after false teachers. And so that we would endure and proclaim the gospel. It's a sermon in itself, but we're not going to make it a whole sermon. We're just going to comment on it really quickly. First, Jesus is telling the disciples that they wouldn't be alarmed when it happens. If you have your Bible open, look at 24, verse 6. What does Jesus say? And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, period. See that you are not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. He's telling us all these things so that we can sail through storms, knowing that we are anchored and secure. It seems like, let's just have a moment of honesty here. It seems like every time there's a new war in the Middle East, I hear people speculate about Gog and Magog. People start to get scared. They start a fresh round of, of getting alarmed because they think that they're reading all the signs, wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes. But that is the exact opposite of what Jesus wants for us here. See that you are not alarmed. That's what Jesus tells us. He says, I'm telling you this beforehand so that you'll know. Often when a couple is having their first child, they will have at least one false alarm. And it can be difficult to know when it's the right time to go to the hospital. I remember when Courtney was pregnant with Lana, it was this weird kind of guessing game. Lana's our first child. She was having contractions, but it wasn't time to go to the hospital yet. You call the doctor. The doctor says, no, chill out. You're fine. You can probably come in tomorrow. And then on top of that, there's this thing called Braxton Hicks contractions that I heard about. I learned about. The first time I heard about Braxton Hicks contractions, I thought it was a mean trick that no one had told me about it. Braxton Hicks contractions are like phantom contractions. It's when a woman's body is getting ready for labor, but it's not actually in labor yet. It feels 
like a contraction. And for somebody who's never had a contraction before, you're like, maybe it's time. Sometimes these, these contractions can happen weeks or even months before the baby is born. Jesus is talking to the disciples in a way that an experienced mother might talk to a woman who's carrying her first child. Honey, calm down. These are just the beginning of the labor pains. Don't go to the hospital yet. It's not your time. It's like Jesus is giving the disciples a birthing class. When the contractions come, just remember, that doesn't mean it's time. Stay calm. But even as he encourages them to stay calm through the beginning of the birth pains, he tells them about a birth pain that's going to be particularly painful, a sharp birth pain. If you've been pregnant, you probably know that some contractions, better than I do, are more painful than other contractions. In verses 15 to 21, Jesus talks about the fall of Jerusalem that was coming. We're not going to read all of those verses right now. We already read them in the public reading. But Jesus tells them that it's going to be horrible, that they should leave as soon as they see these things happen. And in A.D. 70... Jerusalem was sacked. It was absolutely destroyed. What Jesus said came true. If you look into it, you'll see that almost no Christians were in the city. Almost no Christians died in the sack of Jerusalem because they listened to Jesus and they fled. And just like Jesus promised, the sack of Jerusalem was an incredibly gruesome event. Even by the standards of ancient war, which already will boggle our minds, it was horrible. D.A. Carson summarizes some of the things that happened there. He writes this. He says, The famine was so severe that mothers ate their children. Rival groups within the city slaughtered one another and desecrated the temple long before the Roman troops breached the walls of the city. The entire populace was either slaughtered or sold into slavery, and the city was burned and razed to the ground. Not one stone left on another. This is why Jesus says, alas, for women who are pregnant and nursing, a sharp birth pain. But they knew it was coming, and those who believed him fled, and they escaped it. He tells us this so that we would not be alarmed, but we would respond. Second, he tells us this so that we won't follow after false teachers. That's the second point right up here, not another main point. Look in verses 23 to 26 of chapter 4. He says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there He is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders. These are false prophets performing signs and wonders. So as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. So if they say to you, Look, He's in the wilderness, do not go out. If they say, Look, He's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. He's inoculating us against false teaching. False teachers who would claim to have some secret truth or some secret Messiah. If you have to go into a secret room to meet the real Messiah, you should be skeptical. Jesus revealed Himself at His first coming, and when He comes again, everyone is going to know without a shadow of a doubt that He has come. There will be no doubt when Jesus returns. Nobody's going to have to tell you. Look in verse 27, chapter 24. For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, you mean really far away, you see that lightning. So will be the coming of the Son of Man. Everyone is going to see it. Wherever the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. When Jesus comes, no one is going to wonder if He has come. So don't be deceived if somebody says that He has come. The entire cosmos will know that the Messiah has come again. It will be as unavoidable as a lightning and a thunderstorm. As clear as vultures in the sky circling their next meal. It will be visible and it will be known to everyone. It won't be a secret. So don't listen to people who say that it is. Third, he says this so that we would endure and proclaim the gospel. See that in verses 13 and 14 of chapter 24. Those first two things that we just went over, those are things that Jesus wants us to avoid. But this third one, this is what he wants us to do. He's inoculating us against those other things, but you don't give someone a vaccine simply so they won't get sick. You do it in hopes that they will be healthy. That's why you give vaccines. That's why you give people medicine. If someone takes a vaccine, 
like the smallpox inoculation like we were talking about earlier. If somebody takes the vaccine and then they drink maple syrup every day, all day, instead of water, they will get diabetes. And the vaccine would have been for nothing because their life will be cut short. Jesus doesn't just want us to be calm. He doesn't just want us to be skeptical of false teachers. Jesus said this so that we would be prepared to cling to Him through every kind of hardship. He did it so that we would love Him and endure to the end and proclaim the gospel. And to what end are we enduring? That's our second main point. Our second main point is this. Jesus will certainly return. And this age will end. Jesus will certainly return and this age will end. Really, I think that we see this throughout our entire text today where it's not explicitly stated, it's assumed. But we see it really clearly in chapter 24, verses 29 to 35. Immediately, we already read this, but we're going to read it again. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. Then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And He will send out His angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather His elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. When Jesus comes, it's going to be unavoidably clear. We already covered that. And at that time, when He comes, He's going to gather His elect from across the world. But His coming won't be a time of pure joy. There will be mourning. That, will, that day will be, will be a day of both deliverance and judgment. We'll see that later on in chapter 25. But how do we know that this is the end of the age? How do we know that's what Jesus is actually talking about here? How do we know that this is the end of the age that we currently live in? Look at verse 29. When does it happen? It happens, at verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. The days that he's talking about aren't just the fall of Jerusalem. He's talking about this entire age. This age that's characterized by distress. This age that's characterized by falsities. So take heart. Because Jesus is coming back and this age will end. That's why Jesus says what He does down in, in, in verses 32 and 33. He says, From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as, the, as, as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also when you see all these things, you know that He is near the very gates. We can see war and false teachers and pain and distress and persecution of every kind, but all of them serve this same purpose. They remind us that Jesus is near. Jesus is coming soon, just as we just sang a few minutes ago. Relief is just around the corner. Hold on. And to give some extra verification to his promise, Jesus puts a timeline on this. Look in verse 34. He says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Everything that Jesus says becomes true. There are wars, there are famines, there are persecutions. Jerusalem was destroyed. The gospel went to the ends of the known world. All within a generation of when Jesus uttered these words. And now we can cling to these same promises together. So let's take a moment to consider how we can live this out as a church. We live right now in this broken, distressed world that we, were, we just talked about in that, in that first point. It's scary. Persecution is real. The fear of war is real. Nuclear attacks, aggressive nations like Russia and China. Before my grandchildren are born, we might see a war that literally changes the face of this planet. feels like something to be alarmed about, but Jesus already addressed that. As we look at these things together, we don't have to just say, hey, calm down, chill out. Instead, we say, look to the day when Jesus will come. Every time that we are scared, every time that we are persecuted, every time that we experience the brokenness of this world, they are birth pains reminding us the kingdom is coming. So say it out loud to each other. As we look at these things together, we should cling to this reality that Jesus is coming back. And whatever may come, whatever we may walk through, we are His. 
You say it out loud to each other. If you hear a brother drifting over into fear about our political climate, remind him, Jesus is coming back. Let's cling to that together. And before I say that, maybe that proud and skeptical part of your heart is, is rearing its head right here. So let's go ahead and speak to that proud and skeptical part of your heart. Yes, this sounds a little bit quaint. Yes, it is not very original. But this is what you need. You just need basic reminders of the gospel. This is what our souls need. Jesus is coming back and all of the broken things will come untrue. Now there's one snag in all of this. That's our next point. We don't know when He will return. We don't know. It's in verses uh, 36 to 44 of chapter 24. Just look at verse 36. You can look down. But concer- concerning that day and hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only. Jesus, the Son of God, does not know when that day is. So let's tease that out a little bit. If Rob, who works in the accounting department, comes over to you on his lunch break and he says, I did it! I cracked it! I cracked the Bible code! I know when Jesus is coming back. Should you believe Rob? Quiz. No. You should not believe Rob from accounting. (laughs) Rob does not know more about when Jesus will come back than Jesus knew about when Jesus would come back. Maybe that feels kind of silly, but we see it in church history over and over, even the last hundred years. 200 years. In times of uncertainty, people want to cling to something certain, so they just might listen to Rob. Look down in chapter 24, verse 42. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming, but know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake. He would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You won't expect it. So live every moment knowing that he could come back in the next moment. John Wesley is said to have responded to somebody saying, if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, would you change what you're doing tomorrow? And he said, no. Would you change what you're doing today? He said, no. May that be true for us. So when Jesus comes to this, he's talking about this thief in the night language. Jesus is only trying to make a single point here. Listen, he's trying to make one point. Don't over-allegorize this. Don't do that. Imagine coming home for the day. You find a note on your door, and it says this. To whom it may concern, I plan to steal your television tonight. Also, I'm going to do my best to break into your car, go on a joyride before ditching your car somewhere random in the next town over. I'll probably wait until sometime after dark. Best wishes, robber. (laughs) Thieves don't leave you a note telling you when they're going to steal their stuff. Your stuff. They don't steal their stuff. It's not what robbers do. Jesus is not announcing the timing of his return. It's not in a code. It's not in there hidden somewhere. We don't know. We will not know. These signs and these birth pains are meant to remind us that it's coming. And it's coming soon. And we don't know when it's going to happen. Verse 42, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. So, just think about this. We can be so tempted to delay. Just as Timothy was praying earlier. Is there something some sin in your life that you're thinking, I will deal with it next week. I'll deal with it when it's a little more convenient for my life. That's when I will deal with this. Don't delay. If you don't know Jesus and you think, I just want, I want to learn a little bit more. I want to see a little more of who He is. Jesus can come in the next moment. And you would have delayed too long. We do not know. Finally, there are more bonus points after this final one. So, wait for him with eager expectation. 
Wait for Him with eager expectation. Because this world is characterized by distress and lawlessness and false Christs. And we know that Jesus is going to return and bring an end to this age. And we don't know when it's going to be. So, be characterized by eager expectation. Wait as people who are His. Chapter 24, verse 42 tells us to stay awake. What does it mean to stay awake? From chapter 24, verse 45, to the end of chapter 25, Jesus tells four parables to answer this question. What does it mean to wait as God's people? He tells four parables. We're going to walk through them really quickly, and then I want to stop and survey them. So first, um, he, he tells the parable of the two servants, then the parable of the sin virgins, then the parable of the talents, and then he finishes with the parable of the sheep and the goats. So we see uh, there are four subpoints here. If we can just go ahead and put all of those up on the screen, because I'm going to go through them so fast, I, I don't know that we're going to actually be able to go through them one at a time. So first, waiting, waiting with eager expectation means submitting to Jesus without delay. We just talked about this, but we see it in the parable of the two servants that are in verses 45 to 51 of chapter 24. It tells of these two servants. One is actively preparing for his master's return. The other one sees that his master is delayed. And then he takes advantage of that and he starts doing what he wants, living in drunkenness, beating the other servants. Then in verse 50 it says that the master of that house will come on that day and when he does not expect it, and at an hour he does not know, and he will cut him in pieces. Put him, and put him with the hypocrites in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Where the other servant is set over the entire household. Waiting with eager expectation means submitting to Jesus without delay. It also means being ready to wait longer than you might expect. We see that in the parable of the ten virgins. There are ten virgins. Five of them don't bring enough oil to wait long enough for the bridegroom. Five of them do bring enough oil. And then when the moment of the bridegroom comes, they realize, we don't have, five of them realize, we don't have enough oil. They have to go buy more oil. And then when they come back, they realize it's too late. They saw that it was taking longer than they expected and they weren't ready for it. On that day, six months of food storage will do you no good. That is not what preparedness means. Third, waiting with eager expectation means seeking to advance the kingdom of God. We see this in the parable of the talents. We don't wait for Jesus to return in the way that a patient waits in a waiting room. There's a difference. We're not merely existing. There's an activeness to the way that we wait as followers of Jesus. Part of, uh, part of waiting for the Lord means using whatever we have to advance His kingdom. And this, that's what we see in this parable. Wish we could camp out on this parable a little bit longer. There's, there's a lot here. But there's one kind of essential truth that I want to point out. Uh, look down in verse 24. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you, ha- here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scatter no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers and at my coming I should have received what was mine with interest. And then the servant is cast out. The servant acted wickedly because he believed wickedly. He didn't love his master. The other servants acted in love and they loved their master. And that's why it says what what the one who has not, what he has will be taken away from him. Waiting with eager expectation, also means showing love and mercy to the people of God. This is in that last parable, the parable of the sheep and the goats. I know we're going so fast through these. Now, I think that this parable actually stretches the definition of what a parable is, because he uses this image of sheep and goats to show that there's a clear separation between these two groups at the final judgment, sheep and goats. To the sheep, he will say, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And then to, to the others, he'll say, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Why? What's the difference between these two? 
He says, you loved the least of these, my brothers. Or you did not love the least of these, my brothers. Do you love the people of God? You show mercy. This is not a test where if you give people water, then you get to be saved. That's not what Jesus is getting at here. Giving a glass of water is not the cause of salvation, but it is the evidence in that courtroom. If you are one of the sheep, then you will love the other sheep. You will love one of the least of these, my brothers. So do you love God's people? Do you show hospitality and serve and speak for their good? Do you do it out of obligation or do you do it out of love? And you, in both of these cases, if you, look, if you read the text, both of them are actually surprised. Both of them are surprised at what's happening here. The, the sheep are surprised and the goats are surprised. Do you know why? Because neither of them were trying to pass a test. They were just doing what they loved. And what they loved served as evidence in that final court. And so we see in this final parable that everyone without exception, really we see it in all of these parables, everyone is waiting. Everyone. Whether we recognize it or not, we are headed toward this same courtroom. And we will either be on the right or we will be on the left. So we have this fundamental question that we need to ask. You need to answer this question. Do you love Jesus? Do you long to see him? Answer it honestly. Just think, think about that. Do you long for the return of Jesus? Look, look in these parables. I want you to see, I want you to see here what, what I'm pointing about, pointing at here. Chapter 25. I have all of these parables. If you just glance through these, you'll see there's a theme. At the end of these parables, one is rewarded, brought into the goodness of the Father, of the Master. And the other one is punished in all of these. It's a clear pattern that's here. And so you, all of you, all of us, we have to deal with this. Because in all of these parables, you are one or the other. You cannot be a little bit of both. That's not how these parables work. So consider, consider this. If you are not in Christ, then look, it, look, at these, look at these parables and see what Jesus promises here. On that day, you will look into the eyes of God and He will say, Depart from me if you do not know Christ. If you do not submit to Christ. If you don't trust Him. Because on that, and that's, that's not because you're especially wicked. That's the boat that all of us would be in if it were not for the grace of God. All of us, without exception, are goats in ourselves. But He makes us sheep. And so, Christian, let me speak to you for just a moment. Look through these parables. Look through them. Look down. I don't want to see your eyes. Look at the parables. Look, look at what he says to those who, who are on the, the good side of each one of these things. Who then is the faithful and wise servant? Verse 45 of chapter 24. Whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. Then in the next parable, the parable of the ten virgins, the, the virgins who had their oil, who were prepared, who waited rightly, they, they are in the chamber with the bridegroom, rejoicing in a feast. This is a feast that they're entering into. And they're welcomed into that feast. We are going to be welcomed into that feast. Because we're in Christ. The parable of the talents. In each, in each of those cases, one is given much, one is given a little bit, right? And then the one who even who is given less, but is still faithful with it. What does he say? What does he say even to that one? He says, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I've made five talents more. Verse 21 of chapter 25. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy 
of your master. What waits for us on that day? Joy. We look to eternal joy. We could read Revelation 21. We don't have time for that. What does Jesus say to the sheep? Verse 40, chapter 25, And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. And then at the very end, verse 46, he says, These will go away into eternal punishment, talking about the goats, but the righteous into eternal life. So we stop here. And we recognize together that Jesus, there's a day in the future when Jesus is coming. And together we look to that day. So consider your own heart here. And ponder how you can cultivate this anticipation. Long for that day. May we be people who love His appearing. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for the, for the truths that are in this text. And I ask that you would, you would cause the things that all of us need to hear would you cause that to sink into our hearts? Even as I've probably gone too long this morning and, and maybe said too many things, oh, by your grace, would you shape us? Would you shape longing in our hearts for that day when you would return and when we would find final and everlasting peace? And if anybody is here who does not know you, Father, would you draw them to yourself? If they feel fear, if they feel like I've preached hellfire and brimstone and judgment this morning, if they feel that, would you, would you turn their hearts? Because that is not what we are destined for if we just believe in Christ. There's a better hope. Would you save people for yourself and sustain us as those who are yours? We pray this in your name. Amen. So now we come to the, to the table. We have the bread 